I'm in Isaiah 14, and I'm going to talk about how the tables are going to turn. Things are one way right now, but one day the tables are going to turn. In Isaiah 14, 1, it said, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and will yet choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. The tables are going to turn. The first thing is, the Gentiles will seek and serve Israel. That's a, that's a big difference, because right now they hate Israel. But the tables are going to turn. God will have mercy on Jacob. Jacob is Israel. He had his name changed to Israel back in Genesis 32. And God's going to have mercy on Jacob. Mercy is when God keeps you from something you deserve. And Israel deserves to be cast off forever. But just like my eternal security, God doesn't go back on his promise. I deserve to be cast off forever. But God isn't going to go back on his promise. He's not going to go back on what he said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The promise that they're going to get the land and have children as many as the stars in multitude. You see, many see Israel and they see how wicked they are and they say God has cast away his people. But the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans 11. And I'm not saying these are great people. I'm saying God is great in mercy and he will yet choose Israel. It says he will set them in their own land because of his promise to Abraham back in Genesis 15, 18, where it says in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying unto thy seed, have I given this land from the river of Egypt and to the great river, the river Euphrates. He said, the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. The strangers, the Gentiles, they're going to cleave to the house of Jacob. And over in Zechariah 8, 23, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all nations, out of all languages of the nations, even ta shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So you see how the tables will turn. The Gentiles will seek and serve the Jew in the millennium. In Isaiah 14, 2, it says, And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. It says the people shall take them and bring them to their place. So the Gentiles will also have a place, but they're going to serve Jesus Christ in Israel. You see, Israel, throughout time, they've been captive. They've been captive to Egypt. You saw that in Exodus. They've been captive to Babylon, Assyria, Rome. But in the, in the millennium, the Gentiles will serve them. They shall take them captives whose captives they were. If you're born again and a member of the church, you aren't Jew or Gentile. You'll be in your glorified body and reigning with Christ in the millennium. But there's also going to be a faithful remnant from the tribulation time period that comes into the millennium. You're going to have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob from the Old Testament walking around in the millennium. You're going to have children being born to the Jews that were a part of the tribulation, tribulation St. Jews, that will have children during the millennium. So you're going to have Jews that are right with God from those time periods that won't have glorified bodies. You're going to have different classes of saints, if you will, during that time period. You're going to have the church. You're going to have Jews from the Old Testament and Jews from the Tribulation. And you're going to have 
Gentiles that come out of the tribulation into the millennial kingdom. But if you're born again and a member of the church, you weren't Jew or Gentile. You'll be in a glorified body and reigning with Christ in the millennium. And Isaiah 14, 3 shows you the great phrase, in the day. Isaiah 14, 3, and it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hand of, and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. There's coming a day when the Lord is giving rest from sorrow, fear, and hard bondage. So the Gentiles are going to seek and serve Israel, and the Lord is giving rest from sorrow, fear, and hard bondage. The tables are going to turn. Throughout the Old Testament, you saw Israel in bondage. You saw them get off into sin and get taken over by enemies. You saw them afraid for their lives. You saw them in complete sorrow. But when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, it will be a time of rest from all that. It says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For you, your rest from this world happens a bit sooner at the rapture where you will get your glorified body and leave this world behind. But for those Jews that come through in the tribulation, a faithful remnant, their rest comes in the millennium. So, he's going to give rest from sorrow, fear, and hard bondage. The golden city will cease. In Isaiah 14, 4, it says, That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Now, the Lord isn't speaking only here about the king of Babylon but also to the spirit behind the king of Babylon. Just like back there at Mark 8, 33, when he looked at Peter and addressed the devil at the same time, where he, he rebuked Peter saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. You see, he was looking at Peter, but he was addressing the spirit in Peter. Here in Isaiah 14, he's looking at the king of Babylon, but he's addressing the spirit behind the king of Babylon. The oppressor in the golden city will cease. Historically, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, died and was taken over by someone else. Prophetically, the Antichrist, the devil incarnate, is going to be cast into a lake of fire and taken over by someone else, the Lord Jesus. The oppressor will cease. The golden city will cease. And the Golden City is definitely a match with Revelation 17 through 18, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Because in Revelation 17, 4, it said, This place was decked with gold and had a golden cup. In Revelation 18, 12, it talks about its merchandise of gold. In Revelation 18, 16, it says it is decked with gold. But all that glitters is not gold. It's really wicked. And it's coming to an end. The golden city is going to cease. So you have the king of Babylon as a type of Satan. And the Antichrist. And you have Babylon that once again shows up in Revelation 17 and 18. And here are some ways that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and the devil are similar. Here's some ways that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is a type of the Antichrist. In Daniel 4.32, Nebuchadnezzar eats grass like an ox. Well, Satan was the anointed cherub, according to Ezekiel 28.14, and the face of a cherub is like an ox, according to Ezekiel 10.14 and Ezekiel 1.10. Both the Antichrist and Nebuchadnezzar persecute Jews. That's plain. Revelation 12. Both have an image that they want to be worshipped. Daniel 3 and Revelation 13. 
the image Nebuchadnezzar set up was 60 by 6, uh, 60 by 6, and the Antichrist number is 666. That's kind of similar. Both are called dragons, Revelation 12, 9, and Jeremiah 51, 34. Both are lions, Jeremiah 50, 17, and 1 Peter 5, 8. Both are world rulers, Daniel 4, 30 through 32, and 2 Corinthians 4, 4. You see the you see the similarities. But the golden city will cease. The oppressors are gonna cease. The tables are gonna turn. We're gonna the next thing we're gonna get some peace and quiet. When you take out the one making all the noise, it's gonna lead to some peace and quiet. And the Lord is gonna drown out the noise with flaming fire. You know, some most of the time when I go to bed, I like to play some type of background noise like a raindrops, waterfall, even like a fireplace. Well, the Lord's going to drown out all the noise with flaming fire. In Isaiah 14, 5, it says, The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. You see, Jesus Christ is Almighty God. And I don't care how powerful a king thinks he is, Jesus Christ could just grab the staff from his hand and break it over his leg, and there isn't a thing in this world he could do about it. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. Daniel 2.21 says, He removeth kings and setteth up kings. You see, the devil may be the god of this world, according to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, but who do you think allows him to be anything more than a roach on a windshield? The Lord allows him to do anything that he does. The Lord is going to break the staff of the Antichrist just like he did the king of Babylon. This is going to break the scepter of the devil incarnate. And the Lord's going to reign as king because like it says in Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And according to Revelation 5.5, 5, he is the line of the tribe of Judah. He is the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. And when he takes out all the people causing all the noise, we're finally going to get some peace and quiet. The tables are going to turn. Isaiah 14.6, he who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. So the Antichrist, just like the king of Babylon, historically will be persecuted and there is nobody that can stop it. The Antichrist will rule the nations in anger. He is full of the devil and the devil in the flesh. And notice it says, he who smote the people in wrath. He smites smot, them in wrath. In Revelation, it talks about how the devil gets kicked down to the earth having great wrath, and he will possess the body of the Antichrist and smite the people with a continual stroke. No mercy. He won't let up until the Lord comes back. But then when the Lord comes back, you're going to get some peace and quiet. Isaiah 14, 7 says, The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Why? Because the the presser is gone. The groanings come to an end. You see, even the creation is groaning in pain. The trees, the birds, the beasts, the bugs, everything's waiting for the Lord to fix things up. Romans 8.22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. But Isaiah 14.7 and 8 says, The whole earth is at rest. And is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. You see, when the Lord takes out the Antichrist, they'll say, No feller has come up against us since he's laid down. You know, a feller, a guy that makes the tree fall. He was just making everything fall. But since he's laid down, they're at rest. The next thing, 
gods, kings, and chief ones are in hell. The little G gods, the little K kings, and the little C chief ones are in hell. The shoe's going to be on the other foot. The table will be turned. Imagine being a little G god on this earth and waking up in hellfire. Imagine being a famous celebrity that's influenced millions of faithful followers to a never-ending torture prison called the Lake of Fire. The fate of the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan himself is a literal lake of fire. Isaiah 14, 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Hell from beneath. You see, right now, way below your feet, there is a literal hell. I'm not saying that if you dig to the center of the earth that you would hear screaming because I mean, it's the souls of men down there. And in your natural body, you can't hear or see a soul, but it's down there. The Lord says in Deuteronomy 32, 22, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and it shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. The devil isn't in hell yet. Over in Revelation 20, right before the millennium, he's going to be chained in the bottomless pit. But he will be back out and be tossed into the lake of fire. The Antichrist over in Revelation will be thrown in the lake of fire before the millennium. And when he does, all those kings that he deceived are going to look at him and say, You're just like one of us. They're going to say, I thought you were the great king with all the answers, but you're just as weak as we are. When it says hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet the act thy coming, you know, it may be talking about the inhabitants of hell itself being moved to meet the Antichrist when he gets down there, being moved to meet the devil when he gets in the lake of fire. You know, just like you refer to a group of people by their location when it says hell from beneath is moved for thee, you could be talking about the inhabitants of hell. I mean, just like you would say, you know, talking about a sports team, you know, L.A. is coming to play against Oklahoma City. You're referring to the people, the players by their location. You're referring to hell, the people, by their location. So it's like those kings and chief ones and people, the Antichrist led to hell, they moved to meet him at his coming. Hell stirred up the dead for him stirred right up to the top it's like they're moving to meet him at his coming you know jesus talks about weeping wailing gnashing of teeth i imagine they're wanting to take a bite right out of him i mean now look where they're going to spend eternity because of the deception and isaiah fourteen ten, it says and they uh, the people down there in hell shall speak and say unto thee Art thou also become as weak, become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? You think about them saying that to the Antichrist, the one that deceives them. You think about them saying that to the false prophet. You think about them saying that to the devil himself when he's put in the lake of fire. You think about them saying that to the, a wicked king that, that deceived and led a bunch of people the wrong way. You think about the anointed cherub, the devil himself. You think about the angels that sinned. Uh, they die like men. And they fall just like one of the princes because, like it says there, art thou become like unto us. You know, these mortal men saying to the devil, the fallen angels, the antichrist, the superman, art thou also become weak as we? And they will. Because the Lord says over there in Psalm 82, 6, and verse 7, I have said, ye are gods, little g, little g gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. 
they're going to die like men. In Isaiah 14, 11, he says, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. So his pomp, his pumped up haughtiness. You know, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. So his pomp is brought down to the grave. He's brought down to the grave. That cocky spirit puts you in grave danger. That body of yours, you think it's so good? It's just worm food. You're nothing but a maggot buffet. He said, the noise of his vials is brought down. The devil, according to Ezekiel 28, 13, has tablets and pipes prepared in him. But the noise of his vials is He's even brought down. Over in Job 38, when God laid the foundations of the earth, it says the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So there was singing and praising God with music before man. But the devil corrupted it and his vials are going to go down with him. And Isaiah says the worms are spread under thee and the worms cover thee. Worm food. Not only that, but consider Jesus Christ. You know what he said? Their worm dieth not. In Mark nine forty three through 48, he says over and over, where their worm dieth not. In hell, their worm dieth not. In Isaiah sixty six twenty four, it says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die. Neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Just as the, as the Christian gets a new body at the rapture, we get a vile body fashioned like unto the Lord's glorious body. The child of the devil may get a body like his father, a worm. And the worms spread under him, and the worms cover him. All those he damned to hell. Look, they're turned into worms. They devolve down to a worm. In the crucifixion psalm, it says in Psalm 22, 6, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Jesus Christ became our sin on the cross. The worm, our serpent, is sin personified. And Jesus Christ said, when I'm on the cross, you know, a crucifixion psalm, it says, But I am a worm. And he became our sin on the cross. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So, but back in Isaiah 14, 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? You see, Lucifer fell from heaven back there between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And that's when he fell positionally. You know, he was a high-ranking anointed cherub with God, and God gave him authority, but he lost the position. He fell positionally. Now, he falls bodily later. Right now, he can still go talk to the Lord up there, just as he does in Job 1, where he came to present himself before the Lord. He can still go up there, He, but he's fallen positionally. He's not got that same position. And he can still go up there and accuse the brethren. You know, uh, Revelation 12 calls him the accuser of the brethren. It calls him uh, a son of the morning here in Isaiah 14. And in Job 38, you saw where you would find sons of God and morning stars. And he was one of those that was back there singing and shouting for joy at the uh laying of the foundations of the earth as it talks about in Job 38, 4 through 7. So Lucifer would have been one of those who was shouting for joy and singing together, most likely even leading the song with those tabrets and pipes built into him. But something happened in Ezekiel 28, 15 through 17. It says, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee. 
O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. So he fell positionally, no longer that covering cherub. It says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. So the devil gets lifted up by his own beauty, wants to be God himself. And as it says in Ecclesiastes 1, nine, the thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. That which hath been done is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. So when the devil uh, gets cast out bodily into the earth, he's going to, it's going to be just like that. You know, he got, he fell positionally back there in Gen between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And that which hath been is that which shall be. He's going to fall bodily to the earth. He's going to fall again. And he's going to go into the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to go into the temple claiming to be God. Wanting to be just like the Most High. Just like he... We're just like it most likely occurred back there in the beginning. He wanted to be God. And he got lifted up in pride. Said, I'll be like the Most High. So when the Antichrist sits in the temple in the tribulation, what's he doing? Well, that which hath been is that which shall be. He's claiming to be God, wanting to be like the Most High. So what you're reading here in Isaiah 14 with all this stuff, it's the Bible is written in such an amazing way. It's showing you the past. It was showing. Uh, it's showing you history. It's showing you what's to come. So when the uh, you look at Second Thessalonians two four, the Antichrist when he does the same thing, it says, "Who opposeth." And exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. You know basically saying. I will be like the most high. And that's going to happen. Halfway through the tribulation. Because the devil. He's already fell positionally. But middle way through the tribulation. He's going to be cast out bodily. And Revelation 12. That's showing you something. That hasn't even taken place yet. In Revelation 12, 7, where it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. That's not taken place yet, because he, he still goes up there as the accuser of the brethren and all. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren, of our brethren, is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So you see, this is something that's yet to take place. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. But look at this. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when he saw, when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child. So you see, he's going to begin going after Israel. And then in the next chapter, Revelation 13, what do you see? You see the Antichrist gets a deadly wound in the head, but he resurrects to counterfeit the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Satan enters into him. Just very similar to what happened with Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was a devil before the devil entered into him. And in Isaiah 14, 13, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stardust of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. 
Notice Lucifer had said these things in his heart. You may think you got everyone fooled, but God sees the heart. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4 says, He trieth our hearts. What is your motive for your work in the Lord? Are you really wanting to please the Lord? Are you trying to be the greatest at working for the Lord? There's people doing that. Lucifer, Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. And this was, he was saying this before Adam and Eve, before man, saying it in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. Lucifer had already been in Eden, the garden of God, Ezekiel 28, 13, before Adam and Eve had ever even set foot there. It seems he had a throne there before man was even created, and he wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God and ascend into heaven and be like the Most High. As the Antichrist, like I said, would do in the tribulation, that which hath been is that which shall be like father, like son. He wanted to exalt his throne, but what does the Lord say about exalting yourself? Luke 14, 11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. If you want to go up, you got to come down. You have to decrease so the Lord can increase. And then he'll increase you for doing that. Lucifer wanted to increase himself and exalt himself above the stars of God. Stars are like angels in the scriptures. Revelation 1, 20. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Judges 5.20, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. See how stars are like angels, and God uses us, us stars and angels uh, simultaneously or interchangeably sometimes. And you already saw how the morning stars sing together in Job 38, a reference to angels or angelic-like beings. Lucifer wanted to be above the angels, above all the heavenly host, and like the Most High. It says in Isaiah 14, 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also up on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He wanted to sit in the holy mount. He wanted to be on the highest place. He wanted to be in the sides of the north. And that's up in the third heaven. Because in uh, Psalm 48, 2, it says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. That's up there in the third heaven he was wanting to be, exalt his throne to. Isaiah 14, 14, he said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wants the clouds. The clouds are associated with the Lord. Revelation 1-7, Behold, he cometh with the clouds. In Acts 1-9, a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, we ought to want to be like the Most High. We all should be want to be like him. But in the sense that Jesus Christ is our pattern, that's our, uh, our person we follow when we want to be holy like him. He shows us how to live like we ought to live. But we shouldn't want to be like the Most High in the sense that we want worship and ad admiration and the benefits of being God. But that's the way that Lucifer wanted to be like the Most High, you see. Notice also that he has five I wills in those verses. He said, I will five times. He did this of his own free will. The spirit world has a free will, just like me and you. And for every I will, the devil faces a demotion for it. And for every I will the devil had, the Lord gives him an I will in return. Notice in Ezekiel twenty-eight sixteen, you're going to see the Lord's I wills. It says in Ezekiel twenty-eight sixteen through 19, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will 
lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee, I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. So you see five I wills from the Lord right after the devil's five I wills. So for every I will, the Lord comes back with his own I wills. How about that? Signed sincerely, the I am, the real almighty. Isaiah fourteen fifteen. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. He wanted to go up, but instead he's brought down and hell is the lowest you can go. You see, he, he, he said, I will five times, and for every time that he says, I will, he's brought down. For every I will, he falls. He fell positionally. He's going to fall bodily in the future. The Lord said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Uh, he's he's going to go down to the bottomless pit. There's you another fall. And then he's going to go down when he goes to the lake of fire. For every I will, you got Satan falling. It says in Isaiah 14, 16, They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Imagine the Antichrist, the devil in the flesh, Satan incarnate. Imagine the man, the Antichrist, getting to hell and them saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? It's kind of like how an angry teacher looks at you above their glasses when you're acting up. They narrowly look upon thee. When he gets to hell, they're going to reconsider this devil they trusted, this antichrist they trusted. They're going to reconsider this man of sin that they thought was going to fix all their problems. They will say, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? You're the guy who shook kingdoms? Kind of like when they found out who the Wizard of Oz was at the end of the movie. They're like, this? You're the Wizard of Oz? You're the guy? Isaiah fourteen seventeen that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. You see, this guy doesn't have any mercy. He doesn't have any love. He doesn't have any sympathy. He doesn't have any care. He doesn't have anything for anybody but himself. You probably know a lot of people like that. They're acting like the devil. No care about anybody but their self that open not the house of his prisoners. He will not be opening the gate for any prisoners. His prisoners will be saints uh, because evil will be considered good and good will be considered evil. The tables turn. Gates won't open for the Antichrist. Just like he doesn't open any gates for anybody, gates won't open for the Antichrist. The Antichrist will make... The the world a wilderness. When he's in leadership, he'll make places uninhabitable. He will destroy any place that doesn't go along with him. When he's in power, he's not going to care about letting anybody, any prisoner loose. He'll be constantly putting people in prison and in bondage. Revelation 2.10 2, uh, 2, says, Fear none of those things that thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Imagine being the one who put the saints in prison, and then you end up in your own prison. The devil won't get you out of prison, but the Lord Jesus Christ came down to release the prisoners. You were in prison and in bondage to your sin, but Jesus Christ set you free. He paid your bond. He broke your chains. You see, hell has gates, according to Matthew 16, 18. Uh, Jesus Christ, upon this rock, Jesus Christ said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus Christ is the rock, not Peter. 
And he said the gates of hell ain't going to prevail at all. But hell has bars, according to Jonah 2, 6. It's got gates, according to Matthew 16, 18. Hell has keys, according to Revelation 1, 18. And the Lord has those. And before the cross, when a saint died, he went down into the heart of the earth, where there was a comfort side, but also a torment side. Luke 16 describes this plainly with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. You got Lazarus over there in the comfort side, the rich man over in the torment side. And when Jesus Christ died, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he went into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He went down into hell. And he released the saints that were on the comfort side because he's got the keys. And he got victory over death. And now he's given... All these, uh, he's going to give all the saints a victory over death. He released the saints that were in the comfort side so that they could come up to the third heaven. He released the prisoners. In uh, uh, Ephesians 4 8, it says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So Jesus Christ is the one who really ascends. He led captivity a captive. He ascended up on high. He took those people that were in captivity and got them out of there. The devil just wishes he could ascend up on high. He said, I will ascend into heaven. But it's Jesus Christ that ascended, that ascends. Ephesians 4, 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? You see, before he ascended, he went down into the heart of the earth and set the captives free. He set the prisoners free. Ephesians 4.10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So Jesus Christ lets the captives free. The Antichrist and the devil put you in captivity. They want to keep you in captivity. Isaiah fourteen eighteen says, And all the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, everyone in his own house. Not 100% sure what this is referring to, but judging by the next two verses, I think it's referring to the fact that most kings lie in glory and get a great burial after they die. You know, kind of like Asa is described over in... Uh, Second Chronicles sixteen thirteen through 14. It says, And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign, and they buried him in his own sepulchres, which he had made for himself. Kind of reminded me of that own house, everyone in his own house. They buried him in his own sepulchres, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed which was filled with sweet odors and diverse kinds of spices, prepared by the apothecary's art, and they made a very great burning for him. So it seems like that lie in glory, everyone in his own house, that's the way Asa had it when he was dead and had a proper burial. But the Antichrist isn't even going to get a burial. And for a lot of people, this is, you know, this sin is a big disgrace, you know, not getting a proper burial. Over in Ecclesiastes 6.3, it says, If a man beget an hundred children and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that, the, that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. You know, you got all this stuff, but you got no burial. That's seen as a disgraceful thing. The Antichrist isn't going to get one. It says in Isaiah 14.19, But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. And as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden underfoot, under feet. It's like the Antichrist gets trampled under the feet of the horses, thrust through with the sword, and then tossed into the lake of fire. No burial. He gets thrown into the lake of fire, body and all. Revelation 19.20 talks about he, how he is cast alive into it. So I'm not sure if the Lord supernaturally keeps him alive through this torment going on at the second coming. You know, getting thrust through with the sword, 
getting trodden under feet or the fact you know maybe the lord just supernaturally keeps him going to endure that endure that all that punishment or the fact that he's just a supernatural guy himself i mean he's gonna resurrect from the dead he's gonna have the power of the devil and you know he already he's gonna have already rose from the dead in revelation 13 maybe it's just the suit he's going to be supernatural and able to endure a thrusting through and being trodden under feet and then cast alive into the lake of fire but talk about a brutal end to the greatest villain in the bible Revelation 19, 19 through 20, where he's cast into the bottomless or into the lake of fire. Isaiah 14, 20 says, Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial. He says that to him. You know, you're not going to be have a proper burial because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. So he gets no proper proper burial. And notice also it says, thy land and thy people to him. Some people say this hints that the Antichrist is at least part Jewish because he's a Jew killer. And it says he destroyed his land and his people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned, it says, meaning they won't be famous or heroic or celebrated for the supposedly great things they have done. No more millions and millions of people watching a filthy halftime show with women dancing with men they're not married to and men stripping on TV and women dancing like a bunch of whores and people drinking and watching this and getting entertained by filth and celebrating filthy people. Rich, filthy people are celebrated every day. The Super Bowl is nothing but a just a filth fest. But that's where you see the seed of evildoers renowned at. But it, the tables are going to turn. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. There's coming a day when Jesus Christ will be exalted. And all these God-haters with their upside-down crosses and... All the wicked stuff they're doing, it won't be remembered. In Psalm 109, 13, it says, Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Proverbs 10, 7 says, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. It says in Isaiah fourteen twenty one, prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. No more getting a chance to take the kingdom. The kingdom is going to be the Lord's for a thousand years to infinity, to eternity. Israel will get their land. The church will reign with Christ. Tribulation saints will reign with Jesus Christ. And even when the devil gets an army as the sand of the sea at the end of the millennium, he doesn't even come close. They ain't got no more chance of getting getting any land. Isaiah fourteen twenty two. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord. He's saying his family isn't even going to have a chance. Nephew can also mean grandson if you look up the word. It's just his whole posterity getting cut out. And the Lord, the last thing, the Lord is going to gather the wicked nations together. And Isaiah 14, 23, it says, I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, said the Lord of hosts. The bittern is a bird, and he says he's going to sweep it with the besom of destruction. A besom is a broom. The enemies get swept under the rug and mashed on. You ever heard somebody talk about one of these sports teams that got swept? Meaning they lost all the games? Well, that's what the Lord's going to do to the enemy. They're, they're going to get swept. It says in Isaiah 14, 24. Isaiah 14, 23. I will also make it a possession for the 
bittern, and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, said the Lord of hosts. The bittern is a bird, and just like in the last chapter, he talked about how it's going to be a place full of doleful creatures. It's going to be a place, you know, where the animals come and lodge in there because there's no human in inhabitant in there. So he says, I'm going to make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water. And I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. So he's going to sweep it with the besom of destruction. A besom is a broom. And he's saying he's going to sweep them. He's going to sweep them under the rug and then mash on them. You, uh, you think about in sports when they beat a team 4-0 to zero in the playoffs. What, the, what did they say? They say they swept them. The Lord's going to sweep them. The enemy gets swept. Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. If he thinks it, it's going to come to pass. You're dealing with the one that said, let there be light. And there was light. You're dealing with the one that said, I want a sun. And there was a sun. I want an earth. And there was an earth. I want stars also. And there was stars also. So surely as I have thought, he says, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. So his, he's going to gather the wicked nations together. He's determined to destroy the enemy. He has sworn it. He has thought it. And he said it will come to pass. He has purposed it in his heart. And he said, so shall it stand. You can mark it down. It's going to come to pass. Isaiah 14, 25. That I will break the Assyrian in my land. And upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. Notice he goes into talking about the Assyrian, because the Assyrian, like the king of Babylon, is also a type of the Antichrist. So it's speaking historically and prophetically. The Antichrist will get tread underfoot by the horses, and the yoke and burden he's placed on the back of God's people will be removed. Like when you go to the chiropractor and he pushes down on your back real hard and you hear all those pops. You feel that relief. The Lord's going to get the monkey off their shoulders. And the Lord put the cross on his shoulders to get the sin off your shoulders. And he said, this is the purpose that I that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. This is on all the nations. All the nations. God has purpose to do this, and you can't stop him. You can't push his hand back. The tables have turned, and you can't turn his hand back. It is his determination to gather the nations. Zephaniah 3, 8, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. It's to his determination to gather the nations. Isaiah fourteen twenty seven. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? What the Lord's purposed, who's going to disannul it? How can you disannul it? You can't change it. You can't turn the tables back around. It, to disannul something's if you disannul something, it means you make it void. It means you nullify it, abolish it. Nobody can disannul what God's purposed. It says, and his hand is stretched out. And who shall turn it back? You can't turn the tables back. The tables are going to turn. You can't turn them back. You can't. I can't. The devil can't. Isaiah 14, 28, it says, In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. So King Ahaz, a wicked king, the only good thing that came from Ahaz was King Hezekiah. And in the year that King Ahaz died was when this burden 
was on Isaiah to preach. The burden is the prophecy or the word of the Lord that was burning in Isaiah's heart. In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. Re this burden right here. Rejoice not thou, O Palestine, O, o Palestina. Because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. And his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. So. The great red dragon gets smoked. That's the next point. The great red dragon gets smoked. And here in Isaiah 14, 29. He's saying. That just because one enemy is taken away, rejoice not thou, O Palestina. Rejoice not, because another enemy, even more wicked, is on the way. It says, out of the abundance, it says, or it says, out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice. And his fruit should be a fiery flying serpent. I'm not sure what all this means, but I'll tell you what it reminds me of. In Revelation 13, the Antichrist, who's definitely a wicked ruler, he's going to get a deadly head wound. And what does it say over there? It talks about some people rejoicing in Revelation 12, but then it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because that wicked ruler of the Antichrist, he's going to get a deadly head wound. But then he's going to resurrect. And he's going to come back even more wicked because the devil will enter into him just like he did Judas Iscariot. Most likely when he, he gets that deadly head wound, you'll obviously have some men on earth rejoicing. But rejoice not. Because here comes that fiery flying serpent. That great red dragon. Revelation 12, Revelation 13. And he will enter into the man of sin who will be the son of perdition. And he will be even more evil than he was before. When I think of fiery flying serpent, I imagine a great red dragon that has wings like a cherub and breathes fire like it says Leviathan does in Job 41. Job 41, 19, out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. And Leviathan is the devil in his natural state. Isaiah 14, 30, and the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and I will kill thy root with famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. And figuring this verse out completely, it's tough. I'm not sure I can really figure it out completely. I've looked into what other people say on it, and it's kind of, it's kind of hard to figure it out, but it looks like the poor and needy are the ones who are persecuted by the Antichrist, but they're going to find safety and refuge in the Lord. But as you know, the Lord's going to bring a famine in the tribulation. There won't be any rain for three years and a half years, just like in the days of Elijah. And in Revelation 11, most likely, one of those two witnesses are Elijah himself, who probably stops the rain again, which is just another part of the many judgments that come to Israel in the tribulation. Notice he also says, He shall slay thy remnant. When the devil casts down, when the devil's cast down, he inhabits the body of the Antichrist and causes him to rise from the dead. Then he persecutes the woman with child. In Revelation 12, 9 through 13, he persecutes the woman with child, which is Israel. He's going to persecute her. And he's going to slay the remnant. He's going to be killing Jews left and right. Way worse than the than Hitler. And it says in Isaiah 14, 31, How, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestina, art dissolved. For there shall come 
from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. Historically, it has to do with Assyria, taking Philistia, but prophetically, you know the story. There shall come from the north a smoke. Put you in mind of the second coming. Song of Solomon 3, 6. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? Who's going to come from the north like a smoke? Come from the north a smoke. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Every eye shall see him, and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. He's coming down from the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Heaven's going to open. His army's going to follow him on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Isaiah 14, 32. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation? Where are they going to answer them? That the Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. What will they answer? The Lord hath founded Zion. All this time you thought they were done with Israel. All this time you thought he uh, was giving it to somebody else, this whole other group over here, or this whole other group over here. But he's given it to who he said he was. They should have stood with Israel all along. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation? Well, you'll tell them the Lord hath founded Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it.